morning. Welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to worship this morning, this, this daylight savings morning that, you know, is so often the, the, the day that uh, the 9 o'clock service is actually smaller than the 1030 service because people forget to set their clocks, but here you are. That's wonderful. It's great to be God's family in this place. Uh, if you are a visitor with us, a special welcome to you, and we hope that you'll stick around and get to know us over a cup of coffee uh, following the service. We are here as a family because God has made us so, that He has called us to know Him personally as Father, as Redeemer, as Son, as the Holy Spirit who, who binds us as one family. And that means we are called, just as God, uh, we are reflections of God's image, we are called to know Him and to grow in, in faith with Him and to, to go, to be sent into this world, equipped by this hour to be better uh, reflections of God in this world. So we do pray that that happens with you this morning. A couple of quick announcements as we get going. We are receiving new members uh, this morning in the service. You can find them listed in your bulletin. Uh, that'll be later in the service. Uh, Italian dinner for the youth group is coming up this coming Saturday, uh, just six days away. Uh, it's going to be a fun time and, and always good food. We do hope you'll be there. I've been, I've been brushing up on my Italian, so if you have any uh, favorite Italian songs you'd like sung, leave me a note, and I'll see if I can't work them into the, the schedule. Um, Congregational meeting today at 10.30. All sorts of stuff going on at this congregational meeting, so we do hope that you come back or stick around. I'm sorry, 11.30-ish. Sorry. Yeah, 10.30 would be the next service. But if you're here for that, then you'll probably be here for the, you know, yeah, 11.30, that's right. Or shortly thereafter. Depends on the sermon. Um, and then uh, one final, uh, final uh, special announcement. David Hoppe is going to tell us just a little bit about the gospel mission and how we can be involved. Good morning. Well, um, I gave a sermon last Thursday at the gospel mission. It's probably my last sermon. And the reason I say that is I always preach on the same two topics, which are God loves all of us, each and every one of us, and we can all find a way to accept God's love. Well, a man came up to me after the sermon and uh, told me he had found a way to accept God's love, training program, going to leave the mission, find some housing, the whole bit. It was great. I hear those stories all the time. It strengthens me. It reinforces me. He also told me it was the 23rd time he'd heard me preach. <laughs> That's not right. So I uh, don't mind having spent the better part of a decade being the face of Westminster at the Gospel Mission, but it's probably time for me to move on. Uh, there is so much we can do, and it doesn't involve preaching. Trust me, I'll find someone to preach the sermons, whether it's the pastors or other elders. You don't have to speak publicly. It's not a big deal. And it doesn't involve being by yourself amongst a bunch of strangers late at night where you might have security concerns. We can definitely make it so that you can do something. You can contribute. You can be a part of what we consider, if not the most important local mission, one of the most important local missions. And in fact, if you ever pay attention to our budget, and if you didn't serve on session, you probably don't. <laughs> But if you have, um, over the years, we've given tens of thousands of dollars to the gospel mission, and we'll continue to do so. So I intend to remain on mission evangelism and be a force of support, I guess, for gospel mission, but I'm looking for people who are interested in, I won't call it a missional community because it probably doesn't meet that definition, but giving some time giving some effort, being willing to step up and do whatever they can do, whether it's an hour a month, a few hours a month, um, sending, folding, you know, envelopes and stamps and sending out flyers or distribution or actually meeting the homeless face to face. I think you'd be surprised. A lot of these people are enormously lonely, incredibly lonely. And I think that's probably the worst way to go through life. So um, I was going to make you all volunteer and stand and wait until I had five volunteers, but 
rather than make this a long, uncomfortable minute for mission, because I'd love for us to get into the habit of doing a minute for mission so that it's not uncomfortable. If you'd like to um, meet me in the gathering space at 1015, I'll sign you up. I'll take your information, and I'll talk to Jason over at the Gospel Mission, and we'll see what you can do. You know, don't bury your talents. Don't be the wicked servant, I guess. <laughs> uh, please uh, share your life and your love of God with those who need it most. Thank you. Thanks, David. Truly, more than all of the funds we give to this uh, great ministry to the homeless right here in town is the gospel itself. Um, you know, we so often rush past these minutes for mission, so I'd just like to pause for a moment. I know we've got a lot to do today, but just close your eyes for a second and ask the Spirit, is it me? Lord, do you want me to be your hands and feet in this place? We need to be a people who are attentive to the Spirit's leading because He has gifted us to serve Him in this world, even at the Gospel Mission. Well, let's, let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, truly, we are here because we want to be Your children, children with a faith that is alive and producing fruit in this world. So in this hour, Lord, meet us. Show us who you are by your Holy Spirit. Point us to your Son, Jesus Christ, and all that he has done that we might know who we are and follow you and worship you as you deserve. We welcome you. We love you. We worship you in his name. Amen. Let us worship God. <clears throat> I invite you to stand as you are able and join with me in our call to worship taken from Psalm 116. It's found printed in your bulletin. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call out the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of his people. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Our opening hymn is 332, The God of Abraham Praise.
as great as God is and as sure as His calling on us is, the reality is we don't often or don't always live into that calling. We need to each week go before the throne of grace. Each day, really, each moment, go before God's grace and fall upon that grace. Our prayer of confession is again found printed in your bulletin. Let's join together as we go before God. Let us pray. Holy God, in you there is no difference between word and truth, or discrepancy between promise and action. You have proved yourself true and faithful in every generation. Forgive us, Lord, that this is not the case with us. We confess that there is all too often a difference between our intentions and our realities, and a divergence between what we claim to put our faith in and how we actually live. Mend our double-mindedness, Lord, and lead us to lives of integrity that are defined by your character in us rather than by our own fears and desires. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Hear once again the good news of the gospel. By grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. To God be the glory, now and forever. Amen.
cornerstone of the gospel that we have peace and life because Jesus gave up his peace and life for us. As we uh, prepare for a time of congregational prayer, I invite you to turn to hymn number 256, The Old Rugged Cross. Let's sing together why we can have this peace.
candle is out this morning. Sheila Etlick went quietly away to Jesus yesterday. Let's remember Ernie and uh, the family in prayers. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for that cross. That cross, Lord, that, that tells us, that speaks to us, that shouts to us, Lord, of your incredible love for us. A love that is so fierce and tenacious, so stubborn, that you chased us down with your Son, Jesus Christ. That you took hold of all of the things that keep us apart from you. The distractions and the brokenness. The struggles that even today, Lord, we, we wrestle with. And you took them in yourself upon that cross and died that our sins might be washed away, that our death might be killed and rose victorious again in glory that we might know once and for all that this life is not all there is, that our limitations will not define us because we are loved by a great, holy, and wonderful God. Lord, forgive us that we too often allow this amazing story to be sidelined as we face regular old normal days. That our own desires and our own fears and our own limitations distract us from the reality that you you have done something truly amazing that should redefine us from our very core. And we pray again, Lord, this morning that you'd meet us here and reshape us by your word that regardless of what we face, whatever um, struggles and trials this life might bring us or whatever joys and, and glories this, might, might, this life might bring us, Lord, that we would never forget who you are and what you have done for us. And that we would allow that to sink in and define who we are and therefore dictate what we will do. Help us, Lord, to respond in thanksgiving to the grace that you have poured out. We pray that, Lord, full aware that we will continue to be distracted from it. We just ask that you walk with us, Lord, and continue to have patience with us. We come in here this morning, Lord, each one of us bearing burdens, and we pray that you meet us in the midst of those burdens, that we might know that we can lean on you, stand on you, fall on you, Lord, and that that might be a witness that we could even give to this world, that people might know that there is hope to be had and it's real and it is practical and tangible because we believe in a God who walks with us. We pray all of these things, Lord, that, that your will might be done in us and around this world. And we do pray for our brothers and sisters around this world who face trials and temptations just as we do sometimes, Lord, even death itself, simply for be, be, believing your name, for living into your um, identity that you've given us. But we can pray all of these things in confidence, knowing that there's nothing this world can bring us that can take us away from your love. And therefore, we can um, embrace the words that Jesus gave to us as, as your family, as your children, and pray them with him, with his disciples, as we join in that prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Lord God, meet us in your word and transform us by it that we might truly reflect you to this world. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this Lent, we are working our way through the book of James, uh, looking at the areas in which we can cut back negative behaviors or beliefs and also embrace the life-giving um, behaviors that, that uh, can, can take us to new heights in faith. We're using our Sundays to look at the things to give up uh, part of James, and our Wednesday nights, just want to remind you, remind you about those, that we're, we're, we're studying uh, the Scripture again, looking more at the positive areas, uh, the growth areas. So we invite you to come out on Wednesday night and, and take part in that as well. Today we're going to look at uh, giving up, the challenge of giving up cheap grace. Oh, that's a, that's a, a, a heck of a phrase right there, cheap grace. It was coined by um, the German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer in, in 1937 in his book, The Cost of Discipleship. Um, he's not the first one to deal with it. And the German church uh, under Hitler was not the first church to deal with cheap grace it's something we're going to look at in, in James's letter today. Now, this is something that's more than just one of those, you know, my life would be better without it. Bonhoeffer says, look, cheap grace is the deadly enemy of the church. It will kill the church, not just the church, it will kill your faith. And that is reflected in James's words this morning. But uh, again, from Bonhoeffer, grace, uh, cheap grace, what is cheap grace? Cheap grace is a doctrine a principle or a system of forgiveness of sins proclaimed as kind of a general truth. The love of God taught as the Christian conception of God. Basically, cheap grace is kind of a faith as a philosophy. Yeah, it's great to have God out there. It's great that God loves us. Now I'm going to go about my life as usual. I'm going to live my normal life just like everybody else around me. Because I know that God loves me and oh, everything's going to be okay. That's cheap grace, Bonhoeffer says. A belief that intellectual assent in a, in a group of ideas can be enough to bring us salvation. If I just pray the prayer, that's enough. No, that's cheap grace. Cheap grace is grace which amounts to the justification of sin without the justification of the repentant sinner who departs from sin and from whom sin departs, he says. It is the grace that we bestow upon ourselves. That's cheap grace. Kind of faith that wants the benefits of God. You know, forgiveness, new life, heaven, eternal life. We want all those things. But actually ignores God Himself. That's cheap grace. I recognize that's a lot to take in, especially because it's coming from a German theologian and it's early in the morning. But this just happens to be exactly what James is talking about in this passage we're going to look at this morning. And James has an allergy to cheap grace. How can we be a people who long for heaven but ignore the God who fills it? How can we be a people who look forward to the benefits of God someday but ignore Him today? as he walks with us. It is, as James says, absolutely impossible. You cannot be a people defined by cheap grace and know God. This passage we're about to read has been one of the more controversial passages in Scripture because it, it, many people look at it and say, well, well that's a blatant, flat-out contradiction to what Paul says, especially in the book of Romans. But what he preaches really all through uh, his letters, in fact, we read one of Paul's uh, declarations earlier as, our, uh, you know, our, uh, as part of our confession of sin and assurance of pardons. The gospel. We are saved by grace through faith and it is not from us. It's not by our works so no one can boast, he says. But I want you to remember that he also goes on to say, God created us for works which he prepared in advance to do. This defines who we are. And, and so we're going to find that there is actually harmony between Paul and James, even as we open up this passage. James and Paul knew each other 
and they both subscribe to the same basic understanding of the gospel. You can read more about this in the book of Acts. And, and the, the first century Christians were very comfortable putting the, the book of James right up there next to Paul's letters. They didn't see any contradiction at all. And neither did the subsequent generations. There is no contradiction between Paul saying we are saved by faith alone and James here saying we are saved by works or justified, not saved, justified by works. Interesting stuff here. Let's, let's take a look at this. Um, while Paul uses the word justification to talk about the beginning of faith, we're going to see that James actually uses the very same language and, and some commentators even say that James does it intentionally that he uses Paul's language just in order to get people's attention and tweak them a little bit so that they might understand the depth of their faith. Um, he's talking about the same, using the same language to talk about the completion of faith or the final exam, if you will, of faith. We're going to get to that in a moment. Let's go ahead and, and get to the text. James chapter 2, verses 14 to 24. Once again, we're going to walk through it together. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Verse 14, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? James starts out by pointing us to the difference between theory and practice, something I've been actually seeing a lot of uh, played out in, in my kitchen as of late. You see, my youngest has taken to watching uh, cooking shows on Netflix, and believe me, there are a lot of cooking shows to watch out there. And so she is convinced that she wants to be a chef, and I'm really excited about that someday for her to grow up and feed me. Um, but the problem is that right now, as, uh, as young as she is, she still sometimes uh, will watch a show in which these contestants you know, make all these wonderful, amazing dishes. And then she will think that because she has seen it on television, she herself is now qualified and able to do the same thing, right? We have a kitchen after all. There's a refrigerator. We have pots and pans. I can do that because I saw somebody do that. Therefore, she, because she saw it, thinks she knows all she needs to know. Only the reality, as you all well know, having experienced life, is that theoretical knowledge, or having watched it, is not the same as practical knowledge actually having done it. So the fact that you've seen somebody cook an omelet does not make you able to cook an omelet, right? We just know this. Actually getting into the kitchen and working hard and cleaning up after yourself when you're done working hard is not quite what we see on television in these cooking shows. There is a difference between theoretical knowledge and real, practical, helpful knowledge. And this is kind of, in a sense, what James is talking about. Just as not all knowledge is, is equal, so not all faith is equal. There is a big difference between theoretical faith and faith that is actually lived out, in which you've actually gotten your hands dirty because you are living into the reality of what you believe. Belief without a life that follows it is of no use. That's what James is saying. He's not here replacing grace with works, as some people have argued. No, the gift of God's grace is assumed all through the book of James. He says we are heirs, not workers. We are heirs of God's promise. You know what an heir is, right? A worker gets wages because of what they do, because of their work. But we are not workers. We are heirs. An heir receives blessing. Why? Because of who they are. Because somebody else has done the work, and they just inherit it. And James uses that same language, the same language that Paul uses. They both found their theologies upon the grace of God. A gift of grace is assumed. But a life of living faith needs to be defined by that faith. And it will be obvious to any who look at it. James gives us two negative examples and two positive examples. Verse 15, one of the examples. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, 
be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is it? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It's dead. It's useless. There, this is a practical continuation of a theme that James had actually touched on earlier in this chapter, on the practical response to the very real presence of the poor in the community of faith in the early church. What difference does faith make when a poor person walks in and sits down next to you in the pew? It should make a difference, he says. If we are people who are defined by the gospel, if we are a people who are defined by what God has done for an undeserving people, what, who God is and what He has done for us, if we are defined by that, then there will be a very real practical difference in how we treat each other. We're not going to show favoritism towards the rich over the poor. We're going to meet each other and we're going to meet each other's needs because we see who God is and, and what He's done and that defines who we are and therefore what we do. We're going to treat each other differently. And if we're not treating each other differently, then we're not actually people who have been redefined by the gospel of grace. Right? It's a definition, first of all. If that definition is not in you, well, then it's not in you. If you're not living a redefined life, you haven't been redefined. You're still living some other kind of truth. Simply having happy thoughts about the needs of the people around you, he says, is not actually going to do any good to those people. God did not confine himself to happy thoughts. Oh, it would be great if my people were saved. Right? He gave himself. He bled and died that we might be alive with Him. He took real action and God's people will take real action too because they have been defined by this God. If your faith, uh, or is your faith rather, is your faith, your personal faith, making a difference in the real community, in the real lives of the people around you? Does it redefine the way you treat the people you meet every single day? Is the power of God in you affecting the world around you? Is God undoing the curse wherever you go? Right? There's a curse upon this world. When you show up in the room, is that curse being undone? Are you fighting against that curse the way we tear each other down or the way the world tears us down? Is your life an act active battle against that curse? If not... Is your life right now actually being defined by the gospel? That's what James is saying. Verse 18, But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. He's unpacking it here. Belief without action is useless. You know, you can't show belief without action. You can't. It's just words, 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 words. And this has been a real problem, actually, for the Western church. This is one of the most disastrous problems for the Western church, actually. The comfort with cheap grace. This is the reason, the core reason, the number one reason why most young people will leave the church. They will leave youth group, and they will leave the church, and they will never come back. Many of them. It used to be they'd come back when they had kids, right? Right? They said, oh, I have kids. I need help. I better go back to church. But they're not coming back anymore, guys. This is the reality. The statistics are showing it. And the reason that most of those young people give is that it was just words. Was words, 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 words. We never saw it lived. Hypocrisy. And it's devastated generations. Not just one, but several generations. And the statistics in our church show it. Just as right feelings without action don't help the poor, so right beliefs without living doesn't make one a disciple. It's not real. It's just words. Here's the thing about theology. James has a very good practical example about theology and having right orthodox theology. Verse 19 
You believe that God is one. You do well. Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. What's going on in this little passage here? He's talking about right beliefs. You believe that God is one. That is pointing to one of the core foundations of the early uh, Hebrew faith, the Jewish faith, that was then translated over into the Christian faith, that God is one, the Shema of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It goes on. This Shema speaks of the oneness of God, which is carried over our understanding of God. Great, says James, you believe that. That is right. It is true, but it isn't everything. Right belief isn't enough. Even the, the demons have right belief. In fact, you could argue that the demons actually are more orthodox than you and I. Why? Well, they've been to the best seminary there is. They have been to the heaven of heavens. They have seen the throne room of God. They know exactly who He is. And they know exactly what He has done. And they shudder. They know more than you and I. And they respect God in their own way. They say, yeah, oh yeah, He's God. We can see His power. They are keenly aware of the power of God, of the sovereignty of God, of the holiness of God, and yet they shudder. Why? Why do they shudder? Well, they, knowing and respecting and fearing God doesn't prove anything. You can have great orthodox theology and be no more than a demon. They know more than we do. They believe more than we do, but they don't follow. They don't submit to God. Knowing His grace isn't enough. Submitting to His grace is where the power is found. The demons refuse to be defined by God's will. And so they are His enemies. Knowing the gospel isn't enough. We can know the gospel backwards and forwards and still not allow it to shape our lives. What we need is more than just gospel knowledge. We need gospel application to be able to found our lives upon this gospel, the ability to know what difference it makes in my life today and to allow that change to shape me. Will you believe me, God says? Will you truly trust in me? Believe me. Put your life in my hands even in the midst of trials and temptations and tests. James gives us a, a, some practical examples to build um, upon here. Verse 20. Do you want to be shown, oh, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. This is one of the areas that people have often said is the conflict with Paul. See, both James and Paul talk about justification. And both use Abraham as a material witness to point to justification. One justification by faith, the other justification by works. Is this a contradiction here? Is the Bible somehow wrong? Does it fight against itself? Well, no, we don't need to close up shop today. The Bible is true, and, and I think we can look at here and see that, that as they both use Abraham, we can actually use Abraham to figure out what in the world they're talking about. James says, we, like Abraham, are justified by works, just as Abraham was. Paul, on the other hand, in the book of Romans, says very clearly, we are justified by faith alone, not by works, just as Abraham was. Both of them turn to Abraham, and it's helpful for us. It, it helps to us to unknot this seeming contradiction. See, Paul and James, though they use the same words, are actually talking about two, as, two different aspects of the same thing. The Christian life, that's what they're talking about. A life of faith. Both are answering the questions of the gospel. What God has done for us, and how shall we live in response? They're just talking about different points of it. See, Paul uses the word justified to talk about the actions of Christ that made us right with God. That's the definition of justification in this case. To make right. 
When he says we are justified, he's talking about our being forgiven from our sins and put back into right relationship with God. And he points to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 where, where God takes Abraham outside and he says, look up, Abraham, look at the stars of the sky. Look in the heavens and count those stars if you can. You can't, can you? You know what? That's going to be like your children. Your children are going to be like that. You can't even count them. That's the promise of God. And Abraham believed that promise. And it says in Genesis, it was credited to him as righteousness because he believed God in that moment. God makes a promise and Abraham has faith in that promise and God justifies him. Remember, it's God's action here. God's promise and God's justification. This is the foundation that Paul builds his theology on. God's work. God's promise, our faith in accepting that promise from Him. We don't earn it, but it's given to us. But now Abraham has, this, has made this big step of faith. What, how is that going to shape him? What's his life going to be like in response to this promise by God? How is he going to live? Will he continue to live this life of faith, relying on God's promises, trusting in God's promises, or is he going to take his life back into his own hands and live by his own power and strength? Well, that's the question that we're, we're given here. And that's where James comes in. He uses a different definition for the same word justifies. You know, you can justify something by, by making it right, but you can also justify it by proving it right. You remember back to math class, way, way back to math class? And you do your problem, and then the teacher would say, okay, justify your problem. The teacher's not saying, make it right. The teacher's saying, prove it right. Show me how you got there. Justify. Somebody could say to you, justify your, your belief in this. Justify it. They're not saying make it right. They're saying prove it. Show me. Show me it's real. And that's what James is talking about here. Same word, different definition. Our, our works, he says, prove. They verify our rightness. We're already made right with God by what God has done. But our works prove that that has been the reality, that we've been redefined by God. They prove it. They verify it. It's the final exam. And, and because of this, he points to Abraham as well, but he points to a different chapter. He doesn't point to Genesis chapter 15. He points to Genesis chapter 22 and a different uh, instance in Abraham's life. In this case, God has promised Abraham, right, the, the descendants that number like the stars and what a great blessing this is going to be. And he says, this blessing is going to come through your son, Isaac. But in Genesis chapter 22, Scripture tells us that God tests Abraham. He tests him. And he does so by asking him to give up Isaac. God's made the promise through Isaac, this is going to happen. Now he says, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and offer him up to me. This was the first passage I translated in Hebrew. It made me weep. Your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. This is my beloved son. In him I'm well pleased. Give him up to me. What will Abraham do? Will he continue to have faith in the promises of God, although his eyes tell him that it can't possibly happen if I sacrifice Isaac? That promise that you made to me, it cannot come to pass if I give up Isaac, the one thing that means the most to me. Will he base his life on God's promises or will he try to seize hold of it himself, base it on what he thinks is best? This is the test of faith. There's no way that a purely intellectual faith, that handy dose of cheap grace, will ever lead to Abraham's offering Isaac up. It needs a real, deep willingness to rely on God. A deep faith in the promises that God has already made and that God's ability, God's ability, not Abraham's ability, but God's ability to fulfill those promises, even if Isaac is laid upon the altar and offered up. Abraham, in this moment, doesn't put trust in himself or in his beloved son Isaac. He puts his trust fully in God. I don't know how this is going to work out, God, but you know. 
and I believe you, and I trust you. I have faith in you. Therefore, here's my son. The choice here doesn't form his foundation. It proves his foundation, that it was in God all along. And so, says James, you can see that this person, that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Not justified as made right, but justified as improved right. And then James gives us a second historical example. Verse 25, In the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. Here's the story of a Canaanite woman born into a different culture among a different people who is suddenly confronted with the God of Israel whose kingdom is breaking into hers, overtaking her kingdom. And she's given a choice. Will she continue to live the life she's always had, trusting in her own strength, or will she start over, showing herself willing to live into this alternate story, the story of God, based on this God who has come to her? And she, as we see, puts her faith in God. How do we know it? How do we know that she put her faith in God? We see it by the actions that she takes. It's proved as she hides God's scouts and then helps them off to freedom. Again, she doesn't have faith because she hides the scouts. She has faith and so she hides the scouts. And it's a really important distinction. God comes to her and chooses her and she in faith surrenders to his will and then proves that will in her life, by her life. These stories of Abraham and Rahab point us back to James' first question in this passage. Does that kind of faith, that living faith, change anything? And the answer he hopes we're going to see is, yes, of course it changes everything. Because when we trust in God's promises, we start approaching life and reality differently. And God's blessings flow into our lives and through us into the lives of others. It's important to note that this kind of faith that we're talking about doesn't save Abraham and Rahab in the end. But it is actually also the kind of faith that saves us right now, where we're at. Abraham was asked to give up what was most important to him, his son, his hopes, his dreams, and and to trust in God instead. Well, what would have happened had Abraham put his faith in Isaac instead? What would have happened if he had put his faith in his own works well, we know as, as parents or as people who have lived life that when you put faith in something that's human, it will let you down in the end. Isaac would have let him down by... He just would have, because <laughs> he's a person. Isaac wasn't strong enough to hold all of Abraham's hopes and dreams. You know, he could have come to the end of Isaac's life and said, come on, you only got like 11 kids, what's wrong with you? I, had, I was hoping for the stars in the sky, and you failed me. You know, Abraham's got to trust in God. So in that moment when he puts his faith in God, he's actually saved, practically. He's saved from putting his hope in a, in, into a, a situation that would not bear that weight. In the same way, Rahab's life was changing whether she liked it or not. There was a new army coming. There was a new kingdom coming. It was breaking in. And she is saved by putting her faith in the God who is doing the action. What would have happened had she trusted in herself instead? Trusted in her own abilities and powers and and her own city? Well, she would have been pretty disappointed when Jericho fell. Because Jericho was going to fall. When we put our faith in things that are not God, those things will disappoint us because they're just not big enough to hold our hopes and dreams. You can't put your faith in your career. You can't put your faith in your spouse. You can't put your faith in your children. You can't put your faith in yourself, in your health, or your ability to to do anything. Your cleverness. You can't put your faith there. It will crumble in the end. You're not big enough. Your spouse is not big enough. Your career is not big enough. Your kids are not big enough. They can't hold the weight. Only God can hold the weight of our hopes and dreams. And so Abraham, his faith is profitable to him as God's promises are fulfilled in him and also through him, it's profitable to the world. As we see this, these nations being blessed by Abraham, as we see the lineage that will lead to the Savior, Jesus Christ. In the same way, Rahab's faith was profitable to her. She, she was pretty good after the fall of Jericho, actually. She was just fine. 
Her life was okay. It was on track. But also through her, the world got a blessing because Rahab, we, we talked about just a little while ago when we did the book of Ruth, Rahab is, is the ancestor of Boaz, who is the ancestor of King David, who is the ancestor of Jesus the Christ, who came and gave his life so that the whole world might have life. Through Rahab, the world is blessed as she submits her life in faith to Christ, to God. Life comes through faith, not through cheap grace, not through an intellectual assent that, oh, yeah, it's nice to have God in the end to fall on. You need to fall on Him right now. Verse 26, For as the body apart from the Spirit is dead, so also faith apart from the works is dead. We are not made for deadness. We are made for life. It means we need to give up cheap grace, not just for Lent, but for life, and fall upon a God who redefines us each day. We'll talk more about what that positively looks like on Wednesday night. I want to close with a, a reminder from Philip Melanchthon, who was uh, one of the protégés uh, of Martin Luther. It is very important in the Reformation that we understand clearly that we are saved by faith through grace, not by works. Paul's words, right? Also James's words. But here's what Melanchthon has to say. He says, we are saved by faith alone. But we are not saved by faith that remains alone. If your faith remains alone and does not produce works, it is not faith. You are not trusting in God and your life will be the poorer for it. Give up cheap grace and embrace a redefining, radical love of God that has made you who you are, makes and shapes who you can be. Let's pray. Gracious God, we ask that you continue to help us understand what it means not just to want your benefits and blessings, but to actually be your friends like Abraham was, Lord, a friend of God. That's what we long for. Redefine us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. It is our privilege today to welcome several new members into the life and the family of Westminster Presbyterian Church. And so at this time, I would like to introduce the following folks and invite them to come forward and stand here on the floor or on a step if you're able to. Uh, Julie Anderson. Her, Julie's husband, Witt, is, has health issues and is not able to worship on Sunday morning. We welcome him in absentia. Van and Chris Castleman. John and Karen Draper, Larry and Janelle Higby, Bill and Jeannie Johnson, Jim and Corliss Mock. Since you guys are tall, you can stand in the back. <laughs> oh, wait, you are here today. Yay! I didn't know you were going to be here. Wonderful. I'm so glad. Yay. All right. Good morning again. We recently had a new member class and went over the know what it means to know Christ, grow in Christ, and then go in Christ. And it's been uh, such a privilege to get to know all of these folks. You'll see at 1030, we have uh, several more people joining too. Um, do you have room? There we go. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Friends, uh, you know what it's like to become a member of a gym or a club. You get a lot of perks when you become a member, right? You get to say, I'm a member of whatever. Well, when we become a member of a church, it's about a relationship. It's about a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It's about a relationship with other people that we have committed to being a follower of Jesus Christ. We've committed that this is the place where we are going to grow as followers of Jesus Christ. This is the family that we are going to be a part of. And so, friends, Jesus Christ has chosen you and in baptism joins you to himself. He has called you together with us into the church, which is his body. And now he has brought you to this time and place so that you may confess his name openly 
and go out to serve him with the members of this church as his faithful disciples. So therefore, I need to ask you the following questions, and I invite you to answer as a group. So do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you? Will you strive to make him Lord of every area of your life? Will you? Do you intend to be his disciple, to obey his word, and to show his love? Do you? And will you be a faithful member of this church, giving of yourself in every way? And will you seek the fellowship of the church wherever you may be? Will you? Okay. Now to the rest of you. Will you welcome these people as brothers and sisters in Christ? And will you extend to them the fellowship of the church in the name of Jesus Christ? Will you? Okay. How great is the love of the Father that has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. Would you pray with me? And you don't need to close your eyes, friends. Standing up here, you can just look at the ground, okay? God, our Father, we thank you for calling us to be a servant people and for gathering us into the body of Christ. We thank you for calling each of these new members to this church family. By your grace and through the power of your Holy Spirit, may we be the people you call us to be as your disciples. Help each of us to have the mind of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom we give honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So friends, consider well these who are standing before you. They are now family. And to all of you, welcome to this family of faith that we call Westminster Presbyterian Church. And may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be on you all. And I remind you, too, to please stop in the library to get your picture taken before you leave today. We also have your name tag and another gift for you, too. So make sure you all welcome them following the service also. Thank you. You may be seated. Do you find them in the gathering place, hopefully, after the service, and, and make sure they feel welcome. Let's uh, bring our, our tithes and offerings to God.
Gracious God, you have given us all things. We return now these gifts to you in thankfulness, Lord, and ask that you use them for the healing of this world and for the glory of your name. We ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 473, Make Me a Blessing. Let's sing the first and the last verse only. you have a real act of faith in your life, you can't help but live out that song. You can't help it. It overflows. When God redefines who you are, well, He <laughs> redefines who you are. And you'll live and you'll treat people differently. So go be a blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you this day and every day. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.